We'll take up the offering after the message tonight. Uh, unless you have to get up and leave early, then you can give it on the way out the door. Psalm 140. Psalm 140. Would you stand with me, please, for the reading of the Word of God? I got up here this morning in my office about 7 o'clock this morning. Been here all day. And still don't feel like I'm prepared to preach this, but I'm going I'm to give you what I got. Amen? I hope tonight's message will st challenge and stir your heart. Uh, it's a very controversial subject, so uh, that don't make me nervous if it don't make you nervous. I'm just giving you that heads up right off the yeah. bat that I'm aware of that. Uh, but I want to mind the Lord tonight. Just we're living in, we're living in difficult days, yes, and I don't see much virtue in avoiding the elephant in the room. If he's there, you might as well preach on him. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and just deal with it and get it out in the open. And tonight we're going to deal with a subject that I believe needs to be dealt with. I don't think I've ever preached anything even close to what I'm preaching tonight, but I won't be able to say that after tonight. Amen. Are you there? Psalm 140, verse number one. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purpose to overthrow my goings. The proud have hit a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me, Selah. I said unto the Lord, thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. Thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. Selah. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Tonight I want to take these verses, mainly verse number three. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. I want to preach tonight on this thought, the poison of political correctness. The poison of political correctness. Correctness. Lord, help us tonight, I pray. As we look at the word of God, I pray that you would stir our hearts, challenge our hearts. Father, I pray, God, that you would uh, help us now as we enter into the preaching of the word of God. May the spirit of God work and move as only he can in the service tonight. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Patch Club, you can be dismissed. The rest of you can be seated. I almost forgot to dismiss Pit Patch Club. I'd sure hate for them to hear a powerful message on political correctness, but we'll get them a CD. How's that? I appreciate our workers. They work hard to get these kids a Bible lesson and get them all lined out on Wednesday night, and we wouldn't want to mess that up. And so we'll let them slip on out of here while we dive into the Word of God. The world that we live in is filled with almost daily references to some aspect of political correctness. It's also called the PC culture, for short. And for us older Christians, it may just be an annoying term that daily describes pretty much the opposite of how we feel about pretty much everything. But many of our younger generation may feel that we are the ones that are out of date and out of touch, and we're just ignorant and old-fashioned, and I just really believe that it would behoove our young people tonight, maybe everybody, uh, to hear a good message on the poison of political correctness. Now, let me go ahead and give you an opportunity. If you consider yourself to be politically correct, you're going to hate this message, and you're welcome to slip out. Nobody will talk about you or make fun of you, but it might get very uncomfortable for you before it's over with. Yeah. Because I believe with all of my heart that this PC culture is a poison. I believe it with all my heart. Now, the Webster Dictionary describes politically correct as, and I quote, conforming to a belief 
that languages and practices which could offend political sensibilities should be eliminated. That's what it politically correct means. Conforming to a belief that language and practices which could offend political sensibilities should be eliminated. Now, if that's not clear enough for you, let me just give you some examples of what political correctness is today. It is politically incorrect to say that there are only two genders. It is politically incorrect to not accept same-sex marriage. It is politically incorrect to not support cross-dressers reading to four-year-olds at the library. It is politically incorrect to stand up for the rights of the unborn. It's politically incorrect to believe that all lives matter. Every single life on the planet matters to God. It's politically incorrect to say that. It's politically incorrect to be a patriotic, flag-waving American that love their country. It's politically incorrect to believe in the rule of law, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. It's politically incorrect to support law enforcement. It's politically incorrect to think, it's, to think that it's ridiculous and dangerous for everybody to defund the police. It is politically incorrect to denounce anarchy and lawlessness and mob rule in the streets. It's politically incorrect to object when they tell you that you don't need guns because you have the police and then they dismantle the police department. It's politically incorrect to support criminals going to prison. It is politically incorrect to reject the idea that the government has the right to indoctrinate our kids. It's politically incorrect to believe that people that can earn a living have the ability to earn a living uh, but choose to live off of taxpayers ought to get a job. It's politically incorrect uh, to want safe and secure borders. It is politically incorrect to deny global warming. It is politically incorrect to question the health experts that keep getting it horribly wrong about this virus. It is politically incorrect to think for yourself, to point out hypocrisy, to reject groupthink and say what you mean and what you think. Is anybody... Is everybody still with me? I just thought I would expound on that Webster's Dictionary definition of what is politically correct, but it doesn't stop there. It is politically correct to believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's politically incorrect to believe in a literal hell and a literal heaven and a literal God and a literal devil. It is politically incorrect to believe God's word is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice. It is politically incorrect to believe that the church is authorized to witness and win the unsaved. It is politically incorrect to send missionaries to foreign countries to try to convert them from their pagan religions and idolatry. And the list goes on and on and on. That's just a small sampling of some politically incorrect statements that I can make tonight to illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. Now let me say this, the chasm, the divide that separates the people of God and the world, the unbelievers, has always existed. That is nothing new. There's always been enemies of God and enemies of God's people that fight truth and right and godliness. In our text here tonight, in Psalm 140, is everybody still with me? Notice in Psalm chapter 140, David makes multiple references here uh, to, 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 to define some key elements of these people. I'm gonna give you four points tonight by way of introduction. Stay with me now. First thing I want you to notice about this crowd that David's warning us about and talking about and praying about and asking God to preserve, preserve him from and deliver him from, four things about it. Number one, I want you to notice their wickedness. Their wickedness over and over and over again. He talks about them using the words evil and wicked. Look at verse one. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Look at verse two, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Look at verse four. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. You see that? Look at verse eight. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. Verse 11. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Now it's important that you understand this, young people, Mamas and daddies, middle-aged people, senior saints, it's important that you understand the difference in having a different opinion about something and being wicked. It's one thing to see something differently or have a different outlook. It's another thing when your opinion, your agenda, your ideology is described in the Bible as evil, wicked, and ungodly. There's a difference. 
Some things we can agree to disagree about. I'm okay with that. We don't have to agree on who's the best sports team. We don't have to agree on the best food, the best restaurants. We don't have to agree on the best vacation spots. And we can just go on and on and on about things we don't have to agree about. We can have different opinions about, and that's perfectly okay. But when my or your opinion is in direct violation to God's word, that's a different story. These men that David's talking about are just not, they're not just misinformed, they're evil. They're not just confused, they're wicked. They're not just simply unlearned, they were wicked, evil men. Are y'all getting this? There's a lot of people that do not even believe that evil exists. It does exist. I've seen it and you've seen it. We've seen it in our life. We've, we, we're, we're, we're seeing it every day to some degree. We're seeing uh, displays of nothing but just pure evil. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. Well, we just have different opinions. No, we're not talking about if you like it hot or if you like it cold. We're talking about things the Bible is very clear about that falls under the category of wicked, evil, ungodly, unrighteous, sinful things. See their wickedness. Number two, we see their warring. Their warring. Over and over again, David referred to their warring and their violence. Look at verse number one. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. Verse, verse two, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. Verse four, keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purpose to overthrow my goings. Is everybody still with me? These people are not passive, they are aggressive. They're not just promoting an ideology, they are pushing for an invasion. They're not just trying to outnumber us, they wanna overthrow us. Look at verse four. Their purpose, according to verse number four, who have purpose to overthrow my goings. Look at verse number eight. Their agenda, according to verse number eight, is to exalt themselves. That is the same terminology that is used in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 13, about Lucifer. It was Lucifer that said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the sides of the congregation in the sides of the north. Same agenda that Satan had was to exalt himself. That is the same agenda that these wicked men have that David's talking about in Psalm 140. We see they're warring. They're not passive. They preach tolerance, but they're extremely intolerant. They preach inclusiveness, but they will kill you if you don't agree with them. We see their wickedness. We see their warring. Thirdly, we see their words. Over and over and over again, David referred to their words. Look at verse three. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. Look at verse nine. As for the head of those that can pass me about, let the mischief of their own lips Cover them. Look at verse 11. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow them. And we see they further their agenda with their words and with their lips. And we, they further their cause with their debating and their arguing. And I'm going to tell you what's gotten me sick to my stomach anymore is you can't even have civil discourse. It's just absolute filth, profanity, God's name in vain, gutter talk. I mean, I've never in my life heard people screaming in the streets, vulgar vulgarities and profanities and, and cussing and swearing every other word. And David talks about them. They're sharpening their tongues like a serpent, evil speakers, mischief in their lips. Number four, we see their wiles, W-I-L-E-S. He refers to that in multiple points. In verse number five, the proud have hit a snare for me and cords. They have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me, selah. I looked that word gin up. It literally means a baited trap. They, they bait you, they lure you, they, they, they ask you questions so that when you answer them honestly and truthfully from your heart, they got you. Yes, yes. 
They, they, and then they'll take your answer. If you don't shoot your own self in the head, they'll take your answer and they'll twist it and they'll manipulate it. And by the time they get done telling everybody what you really meant and what you really said, that ain't what you said at all. Had that happen for me, I was in the court hearing a few weeks ago. By the way, there's still no verdict on our court hearing. I don't think that judge wants to rule, to be honest with you. I'm thinking he's waiting for Jesus to come back where he won't have to bother with it. That's what it looks like to me. But we sat there for several hours during that hearing, and toward the end, the county attorney, she asked me, she said, so let me, let me ask you a question. Is it, is it because you didn't agree with the county executive that you just decided to go ahead and have church? Is that, I said, I don't, I don't like the way you worded that question. Well, let, 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 let me reword it. And she reworded it, and I don't know but what it wasn't worth the second time than it was the first time. So basically what you're saying is because you didn't agree with the county executive uh, shutting the churches that you just decided you were just going to open church anyway. Well, no, I don't, I don't like the way you worded that. That's not how that happened. What was they trying to do? Trying to get me to trip over my words. Right. Trying to, try, they were trying to get me to walk into a trap is what they were doing. What they didn't know was that I had prayed and got a hold of God before that hearing, and I seen it coming a mile off. And even that judge, I said, with God's help, God, praise God, give God the glory. And I said, uh, I said, as far as I know, we hadn't had anybody in our church come down with COVID, as far as I know. He said, well, you ought to knock on wood. I said, no, we don't knock on wood. We give God the honor and we give God the glory. Hey, Amen, I don't knock on wood. But they put words in your mouth and they, they try to, they lay traps. That's what David's talking about here. The proud have hit a snare and cords. Look at what he says in verse number eight. Grant me, O Lord, grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked, further not his wicked device. We see the wiles. David pointed out the snares, the cords, the nets, the gins, the wicked devices. He refers to the evil and these violent men of his day as poisonous serpents and adders in verse number three. Satan is referred to in Genesis chapter three, verse number one, as a serpent that was more subtle than all the beasts of the field. Whenever you see an analogy or reference to a snake or a serpent, trust me, it's not a good thing. That's what Jesus called the Pharisees. He called them a bunch of serpents and snakes and vipers. That wasn't a compliment for you reptile lovers. We know Satan is the god of this world, prince in the power of the air. It stands the reason. Uh, he's referred to, Satan is in Revelation chapter 20, verse number three, he's referred to as that old serpent. That old serpent, a dragon. Stands the reason that Satan's mode of operation is to deceive and to lie and that his words are poison. Therefore, his followers and the wicked and evil men that are under his control will also deceive and their words will also be full of poison. In fact, in Psalm chapter number 58, David said in verse two, yea, in heart ye work wickedness. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. He talks about the wicked, evil men, and he uses that deceit, he uses that violence, and he uses that poison as the snake, all of it right there together. The ideology and the influence of this PC crowd is poisonous, make no mistake. It's deadly, it's detrimental, it is destructive, it's poisoned several generations of young people. It's poisoned uh, the colleges and the halls of higher learning in this nation. It's poisoned untold thousands of Bible preaching churches. I'm shocked at the power, influence, the poison of political correctness even in churches today that used to stand for what was right, but somewhere along the way, the cat got the preacher's tongue. give you three points tonight and we'll be done. Number one, I call this the poison of political correctness because it chokes God's precepts. Chokes out the word of God. It chokes 
The word of God. You say, what in the world are you talking about? I'm so glad you asked me that. Turn over to Mark chapter number four. I want to show you this from Mark chapter number four and everything I'm giving you is Bible. I'm just taking current events. I'm taking a culture, this PC culture that we are surrounded by, that we're drowning in, and I'm drawing an analogy from the word of God because it's relevant and it's where we're at. And if we don't recognize PC culture, if we don't recognize this political correct garbage for what it is, we're gonna get sucked into it just like millions of other Americans. It chokes out the word of God. Look at Mark 4, verse 15. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves. And so endure before a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in. Choke the word. Is that what your Bible says? It doesn't choke the hearer of the word. It chokes the word. I had to read it a half a dozen times to make sure that's what it said, even though I know that's what it said because we know that God's word does not return void. The Bible says that very clear that his word does not return void. It says in another place, his word is not bound. But Paul prayed and asked prayer that the word of God would be given free course. Did he not? Sure he did, because there are places where the word of God is not welcome. There's places where the word of God is not wanted, and there's places where the word of God cannot thrive. Why? Because the cares of this world, I'm still in the Bible, the cares of this world and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word. Literally chokes the word of God. Now you can't get any more powerful than the word of God. He's exalted his word above his name and he's given him a name which is above every name. The word of God's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. We know that, yet this, this culture, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word. This PC culture literally chokes out the word of God. I can say with my hand up tonight, I have seen it happening while it was happening, while I was preaching. There's probably not too many, but there's probably a couple in here right now choking. You was choking about 20 minutes ago when I started giving you a list of things that's politically correct. What happened? Your mind and your ideology came in conflict with the word of God and the cares of this world and the other things entering in literally renders the word of God ineffective in your heart and mind. Chokes out God's word, chokes it out. It can't breathe. It's poisonous in that once the person has been exposed to the truth then they begin to battle in their mind and in their hearts and in their soul and in their will and Satan's pulling and the seed has been planted and he comes and snatches the seed away and the word's planted and he comes in and begins to choke it because he don't want you hearing God's word. God's word's politically incorrect, always has been and always will be. It's the most hated book in the history of civilization. Notice in verse number 17, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, they are offended. What happens? Pressure. PC culture begins to put the pressure on them. And it's in direct violation, opposite of what the Bible says. And instead of getting offended at the world, Instead of getting offended at Satan, instead of getting offended at the lies of Satan and the tactics of Satan, 
they get offended at the word. Most of the world, most of America, if given a choice between the word of God and their friends, popularity and acceptance, they'll turn their back on the word of God 10 times out of 10. And I, I'm not even talking about the world. I'm talking about church people. Most church people, most teenagers, I've watched them come to that crossroads in their life. 13, 14, 15, 17, 18, they come to a crossroads where they have to decide, am I going to go with God or am I going to go with the cares of this world? And the cares of this world and all those other things that enter in choke out the word of God. Chokes it out. Never even has a chance to take root. Never has a chance to bring about a change in their life. They choked it out before it ever got started. I'd like to have a dollar for every graduate from a Bible college that never made it six months. Six months. Only about 5% of Bible college graduates even enter into the ministry cares of this world and other things that enter in choke out all that word of God that they heard, all that preaching, all that teaching, all those chapel services, all those Bible classes choked it out because they want to stay relevant. I'm woke. Preacher, I'm woke. You're the one that's not woke. Woke? I never went to sleep. What are you talking about? Of course I'm not woke. I never went to sleep on God. It chokes out the word of God. Number two, I call it the poison of political correctness because it cramps the men of God. Cramps. It's like preaching with a vice around your throat. It's like preaching. Now, thank God it ain't like that at this church. Every now and then, when I preach like I'm preaching right now, every now and then, it gets a little bit tight, but for the most part, I can preach whatever God lays on my heart at Calvary Baptist Church, and I thank you for that. I can't remember the last time somebody got up and walked out mad. And I can't remember the last time somebody come out the door and fussed at me on the way out the door, told me they didn't like what I preached. I don't know if it's because my preaching is so agreeable or it's because I got a couple of Baptist bouncers standing beside me ready to bounce their head on the pavement if they do. But seriously, most if not all of God's men in the Bible were without a doubt politically incorrect. Joseph stood in front of Pharaoh and told him, there's a seven year famine coming. You think he wanted to hear that? Moses stood up against Pharaoh and his entire court and said, let my people go. You think that was easy? And he was warning for murder to boot. Elijah confronted Ahab and Jezebel and their idolatrous, idolatrous, wicked lifestyle. Said it won't rain till I say so. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. I'm pretty sure that would fall under the category of being politically incorrect. Nathan stood there and called out David for his sin with Bathsheba and said, thou art the man. I'm talking about political correctness. Many of the prophets were outspoken to the political leaders of their day. Jeremiah and Micaiah and these others thought about Daniel. I just thought about Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel, in chapter number one, refused to eat the king's meat. Then a couple chapters later, he refused to bow down and, 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 and he refused to stop praying when the, when the king told him not to. And then you get over to about chapter number five and he tells Belshazzar, he said, you've been weighed in the battle says, and you're found wanting. You're not gonna make it through the night, pal. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're talking about politically incorrect. It don't get any more politically incorrect than Daniel. Right. Right. What about John the Baptist? Oh, yeah. Told Herod it's unlawful for him to have his brother's wife. Yeah. That's not how you win friends and influence people. Paul stood before multiple kings and dignitaries and told them they were lost and needed to be saved. Jesus, the most politically incorrect preacher of all, 
look the religious political leaders of his day in their God-given eyeball and call them all a bunch of snakes and vipers and whited sepulchers and cups full of excess. Is everybody still with me? I'm about up to here. With these preachers telling me I'm not Christ-like because I don't tiptoe through the minefield and somehow or another manage to never say a blessed thing. Why don't you just say what you mean and quit beating around the bush? I'm going to tell you something now. Won't you be more like Christ? Okay, you bunch of snakes and vipers and whited walls. You want me to preach like Jesus? I can do it if I need to. I don't really want to because I'll probably lose most of you. Why don't you be more like Jesus? I'll come in here one day and start flipping tables over and see what happens. Take a whip, start chasing out all the thieves and the robbers. Take a whip to the non-tithers and see if you want me to be like Jesus anymore. Come on now, stay with me. I wish we had a preacher that was more diplomatic. No, you don't. No, you don't, because if you really believe that, you'd be somewhere else instead of being right here. I just, wish, I, just wish, I just wish Pastor Schiff would just, I wish he would just be, I wish he just wasn't so rough around the edges. I wish he, I wish he could just say it nicer. Nicer. Tell you something right now, if John the Baptist showed up, John the Baptist would have on camel's hair, he'd have on a leather belt, he had hair out to here because he was a Nazarite, he had locust and wild honey running out of the corner of his mouth. And he'd get up right in your face and say, why don't you bring me fruit and meat for repentance before you talk to me about getting baptized and joining the church? He was so rough around the edges, Herod's wife said, I can't wait till he gets his head cut off. And, and Herodias danced before Herod, and Herod said, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And she ran to her mama. She said, Mama, he said he'd give me whatever I wanted, even half the kingdom. She said, you tell him you want John the Baptist's head on a charger. She went back to Herod, and she said, she said, Mama wants me to tell you that we want John the Baptist's head on a charger. I reckon he got his head cut off because he was so diplomatic. And he was so sweet. And he was so understanding and so compassionate. He just knew just the right words and just knew just right where to pause and just knew how to get the maximum effect. And he just knew how to drop in those illustrations and give those little one-liners. And it was just so polished and it was so perfect. No, no, no. And here's what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, there's never been a man born a woman greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said, that's my kind of preacher right there. That's my kind of preacher. His ministry lasted, his ministry lasted every bit of six months long. I remember when they started, when I started out, they said, well, when you've been preaching a while, you won't preach like that. And I said, Lord, I hope not. I hope I'm stronger and harder and more in love with the Bible than ever before coming up on 26 years, July the 10th, that's the day after tomorrow, I'll be preaching 26 years Friday. They said, oh, he won't preach like that long. He'll change. They always start out gung-ho, but then when they get older and get a little bit of wisdom, then they level off. Well, I guess I'm as dumb as a box of rocks because I'm crazier than I've ever been. I don't plan on backing down. I don't plan on dialing it back. You say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that the man of God throughout the scriptures, when he preached the truth, it was politically incorrect and the pressure was always there and the knowledge of potential offense was always there. People that reject truth for popular, fashionable, trendy beliefs always put God's men in a bind. I've been places before and tried to preach, and it was like trying to swallow grape nuts without milk. That's all I could do. I've gotten down before from preaching, and my head splitting wide open. I'm telling you, it was so tight. I'm trying to preach, and there was everybody in there had a wall up. 
Everything I preached was coming back at me. You know what it did? It cramped me. That's why we talk about preachers having liberty to preach. And I talk about that a lot because it's a big deal. Amen. When a preacher comes here and, they, and we get to the house and we're sitting around the table, and they look at me and say, preacher said, I had good liberty tonight. I say, praise the Lord. That makes all the difference, don't it? You ever tried to cut down a tree with a dull axe? You ever tried to preach when people in there didn't want to hear it? Because they've been watching Hollywood all week. They've been on social media all week and all that's already infiltrated their mind. They've already got their mind made up about how everything's supposed to be in this world. And then they come to church and you get up and tell them the exact opposite. They don't want to hear it and it cramps the man of God. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse number nine, that is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Here's what he said, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path. They said, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. What about that? They're telling the prophets, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, and cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression, and perverseness, and he goes on and on and issues judgment on a group of people that looked at the prophets and said, would you please prophesy lies to us, please? Get out of the path, get off the narrow path, get out of the way. We don't want God in front of us. What are they doing? Cramping. The man of God. Number three, I'm hurrying. It's called poison. I call it poison because of the fact that it literally corrupts the people of God. Just like poison. Just like poison ruins whatever it touches. Just like poison, if you put it in a drink or if you put it in a food, I mean, it ruins it. No matter how good it was, if you put poison in there, it's done, it's over. That's political correctness is poisoning, corrupting the people of God. That's why I'm preaching this tonight. You say, preacher, you're preaching this on a Wednesday night. You got your core, your nucleus is here on a Wednesday night. I know that. But I'm telling you, political correctness is killing us. It's killing our churches. It's killing our families. It's killing our young people. We're getting to the place to where we don't even notice it anymore. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse number three through five, if any man teach otherwise, Paul said, and consent not to wholesome words, healthy words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is God in us. He said, from such withdraw thyself. Don't hang around people that are spewing this garbage. Leave them alone. Stay away from them. Don't watch their television programs. Don't listen to their radio broadcast. Don't listen to their podcast. Don't go to their websites. Don't subscribe to their newsletters. Don't watch their Instagram videos. Don't watch their Facebook posts. Leave them alone. Withdraw yourself. It's poisonous. Amen. It'll corrupt you. It'll ruin you. Evil communications corrupt good manners, the Bible says. Preacher's up preaching his guts out and kids will go home and watch a video and just everything that the preacher just preached just goes right out the window. Well, this person must be legit. They've got a million followers on Twitter. And what's your point? Colossians 2, verse 6 through 8, as ye have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. What'll happen? The world, rudiments of the world, and the philosophies of the men in the world, they will corrupt you. 
They'll take all the good and render it pretty much completely worthless. You could take a beautiful birthday cake, put one little squirt of arsenic on there. I don't want none of it. Mm -mm, just sprinkle, just sprinkle a little bit of fertilizer or, or rat poison on it. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not scra scratching it off. You can have it. And I'm gonna tell you where it's gotten today, even with television. People digging through a trash can to find a biscuit. Even the commercials are ungodly. Hallmark, Hallmark Channel now, featuring romance. Going to be starting romance movies with same-sex marriage in it. You'd be shocked at how many Christians will sit there and watch that. Think it's ain't that something? Ain't that cute? Ain't that pretty? Preacher, it's 2020. You need to get with the program. No, you need to get in your Bible. You've already been corrupted by the PC culture. If you think two men getting married, two women getting married is woke. It's not woke. It's an abomination in the sight of God. It always has been and it always will be. And if God don't judge America, he's going to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. You heard what I said. This PC culture, it's killing us. And preachers are trying to pastor their churches to people that are up to their eyeballs in PC culture and they're straddling the fence and they're trying to give them just enough Bible to keep it from getting any worse than it already is. But we're losing the battle because preachers quit preaching on sin. They quit preaching. Well, I want to fill my church up. Well, I can tell you how to fill your church up. Offer free beer. You can pack the place out. But then what you got? What have you got? Crank up some rock and roll music. Turn the lights off. Get some half-naked girls up here swooning and singing in the microphone. Get, get the drums going. Let your guitars going. Get a little coffee shop in the back. You can fill it up. But what you going to have? What you going to have? When I come to church, I want to come to church. I don't want to come to a bar. I don't want to come to a nightclub. I don't want to come to some place where I got to fight the flesh and deal with all the sensual garbage. I want to come somewhere that's clean and it's pure and it's right. And as long as you try to put one foot in the Bible and the other foot over here in the PC culture, you're going to mess up because you're going to have corruption. You're going to mess on your hands. You're going to mess on your hands. And preacher, you know that this preaching right now can get you in trouble. I stay in trouble and I don't care. I don't care. It don't make no difference to me. I see what's going on in the streets of our city and somebody's got to say something. Lord knows our elected officials ain't saying much. They ain't saying hardly anything. It turns my stomach. I put out on social media yesterday, I said, I'm going to tell you why professional sports is full of liberal Democrats. It's because Republicans can't play offense or defense. They can't say a blessed thing or do a blessed thing. I'll preach, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe I just said that either. They all are eat up with PC culture. Everybody's eat up with it. It's ruining our society. Brother Johnny, that's the problem. Everybody's walking on a tightrope. Well, I don't think I can say that. They have to have a little powwow with their staff. You think I should say anything? No. Let's see. No. The wind's blowing that away. Maybe you ought to just not say nothing about that. If I checked the wind every time before I preached, I would never preach again. That's right. You're right. That's still the book. Yeah. By the way, let me end this on a positive note. Some of y'all are squirming. You're going to wear out that pew. Would you quit? <laughs> let me close with this. Chapter 140, verse 12 and 13 is awesome. I know the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name the upright shall dwell in thy presence. You know what God's able to do? He's able to prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies, amen. They're barking and they're howling and the snakes and the vipers and the poison and the asp and the, and the, and the traps and the snares and right in the middle of all that, we can experience the goodness and the blessings and the presence of Almighty God, amen. We don't have to get caught up in it. We don't have to get sucked into it. We can stand for God and live for God and enjoy God's blessings in our life. Amen. Amen. We'll just stay close to him, amen.